There is a question in the chat whether I can explain assignment number three. Okay, this is assignment number three. Assignment number three refers to the snow fund. Hmm? <clears throat> we are looking at the snow fund as follows. The snow fund was 100 swaps and each of them required $20 million. So the result is two billion. Hmm? As I explained last week, the reason we may need $20 million is so we can enter into the swap contract. Our counterpart is the city and the ski resort may insist that we have a collateral of 20 million, but maybe they don't. <clears throat> Sometimes you can enter into a contract when you don't have all the money you may need. So in this assignment, I'm assuming that there is a funding ratio of X percent. So if let's say X, X is 100%, so X equals one. That means that we are in the same situation as we were in the lecture notes. The fund needs all of the money. We need two billion and the financial for two billion we saw. In million, that will be 2000 million. We have a profit of 200 million. And then there was some, um, I think we're 7.2% return. Remember this? Okay, we saw these financials. If my funding ratio X is smaller than one, that means I don't need 20 million. I will need 20 times X million which is a smaller amount. So this number here is, is 2000 times X. But this is the same. And many of these things are the same. Some are the same, some are not the same. And I need you to calculate the financials. Tell me how much money we make here. And what is the percentage return we expect to get as a function of X. Okay. Okay, let's see if this is clear. Is this clear? You can ask me if it's not clear. I'll explain. I'll give you an example. I just don't know if this is too easy or too difficult. You have to tell me. Someone say something? Check the chat. Okay. Yes. Okay. So it's understood. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. Let's say that X is a half or 50%. We only need half the money. For each swap, we need $10 million, not 20. Then my financials would be I will have $1 billion. I have 200 million of expected profit. I'm going to be paying a 1% management fee, that's $10 million. That gives me a profit of 190. So I'm going to pay 20% of 190, which is 38. So that is, I think is 48. And that means that I'm going to make a profit of 200 minus 48, which is 152, I think. Okay, that's 152 over a $1 billion investment. That's the profit. Huh? And that means a 15% return, 15.2% return. I think I did it right. Maybe I made a calculation, I'm improvising, okay? If I made a calculation, you have to fix it. But, I th but this is how it goes. You see, the profit goes much higher. The profit goes much higher when, when I'm allowed 
leverage, when I can invest less money because my profit is the same, my profit is the same because I'm still entering into 100 swap contracts. My profit is the same, but I invest less money. So this is higher. I need you to come up with this number as a function of X. I need you to model this financials as a function of X, okay? Okay, I hope it's clear. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me. And if the, this is an important assignment. So if you have some difficulties doing it and you need more time, to just tell me and then I will give you more time. I can explain this again next week, okay? But this is an important assignment. It shows you that with leverage, you can increase the performance. Now, I have included here another, it says extra points, determine the probability of default. What does that mean? This is, excuse me, this is only for extra points. Hmm? And this, if you want to do this, you'll have to do it later. You don't need to do it now. You can do this before the end of the course, okay? Before the end of the course. Because some of the things that we will see, especially today, will be useful to do this, okay? So the, the part which is due March 23rd is this one. This one is not due. Not due, okay? Yet. It's due before the end of the course. And what does this mean? This requires some modeling. That's why it's more advanced and that's why I only ask you to do it later. Um, the probability of default is as follows. We expect, we expect to make uh, 200 million profit. That's what we expect, okay? But maybe we don't, maybe we lose money. Why? Because we have a swap one, swap two, swap 100. There's 100 swaps. And with 100 swaps, anything can happen. This is just the expectation. We saw last week, and we're going to see today again, that this is a standard deviation of gains and losses, of profits and losses. So that means that the right way to model, this is my 200 million expected, this is my expected profit, but my actual, my actual profit is something like that. <clears throat> it's a Gaussian. Hmm? That's my expected profit. <clears throat> and you see there's a probability that I lose money. If, if I'm here, I can lose money. And if I lose, if I lose more money than I have, that will be a default. Of course, when X is one, when I have all the money, when I have $2 billion, the probability of default is zero. I have all the money. I can never lose more money than, than, than what I have. I have $2 billion. I have all the money that I need. I will never default. Even if all of the swaps go wrong, I still have money. But if, I, if X is less than one, the probability of default is bigger than zero, okay? Maybe very small, but it's bigger than zero, and it's related to the quantile of a Gaussian. We will we will learn this later. Don't have, if you want to do this, this is for the end of the course, not for now. You will learn how to do these things later. Hmm? The probability of default is something which is related to uh, the rating of the fund. Okay, so for example, you know what the rating of a bond is. 
Do you know the rating of a bond? Yeah, so I mean, some bonds are rated triple A, some are rated C. For example, right now, you probably have read in the news that the Russian bond has been downgraded. Downgraded. That means that the rating is lower. Probabilities of default can be turned into ratings and they express the probability that the counterparty will not pay. You may have read in the news, I'm not sure, that um, Russia had a bond coupon payment due yesterday and there was some uncertainty whether they would pay. They actually paid, so there was no default. Okay, So when you owe money and you don't pay, it's called default. Hmm? Okay, this is a very interesting area, but we're not going to talk about it. Uh, but this assignment connects with it. See if you can do this, and if you have difficulty, I can explain this to you again. Okay? All right. Any, any more questions on the assignment? No more questions? Okay, so if there are no more questions, I'm going to then move back to my um, regular assignment. So my regular presentation. I'm gonna switch presentations. So last week I started the um, concept of quantitative methods and we saw, we saw a little bit of the history, we saw some definitions, uh, we saw how we do portfolio statistics. Mm -hmm. Came back to the snow swap example here. Um, for example here, if, if this is zero, that will be the probability that we lose money. And if all our capital is here, that will be the probability of default. If that's my capital. Okay? You see, all of these things are connected. But we saw this, we saw this last week, and we went as far as to uh, defining the or explaining the expected return, the expected volatility. We see how return over time works, different types of return. And we even saw how machine learning sometimes is used to get some ideas about the, the risk characteristics of investments. <clears throat> uh, we saw that sometimes strange artifacts occur when you're looking at return over time. Uh, we came up with the concept of market timing alpha, which measures how good you are at buying low and selling high. Mm -hmm. It's here. And we, de we explain the concept of correlation and covariance, which tells us the relationships between investments, for example. And we saw this formula that expresses portfolio volatility in a matrix algebra four involving the variance covariance matrix and the investment allocations to each of the assets. And this is the one that shows to us that when correlations are small, risk goes down. Okay, so risk goes down as correlations go down. And this is very important because the concept of diversification, which is so important when you invest, this is the reason why it works. And I make the connection between this and our snow fund, because in our snow fund, <coughs> the correlations between the swaps were zero. That means that when you apply this in this formula, that's why the, the correlation 
of 100 swaps being zero meant that the standard deviation was the, the, the square root of 100, not the square, not 100, a square root of 100 times the individual swap. And that's why the risk came down from 50% down to 5%. That reduction of risk comes from the concept of diversification. Okay? And it comes here. This is the square root formula that gives us that. This is what we saw last week. We ended here. Any questions? All right, so what I'm going to do now is everything that you just saw is something that Markovic knew in 1952. So he used these concepts to create a new way of investing. That was the beginning of quantitative investing. Looking at return, return was not new, everybody was doing that, but looking at risk. Okay, so the first person to look at risk, that was Markovic. Markovic is the one who introduced the concept of risk. And what he proposed is that when you look at an investment, you have to look at two things. You have to look at the expected return and you have to look at the standard deviation, which is going to be our surrogate for risk. Now, today, this is everybody knows this, and now you do too. But in 1950, people didn't think like that. So this was new. In 1952, this was a new way of thinking. And it's a very important way of thinking because we're dealing with two, two quantities, two parameters, return and risk. And as you know, when you're dealing with return and with risk, when you're dealing with two variables, calculations are more difficult because you have to think in two dimensions. People are usually used to thinking in one dimension. Now we're gonna think of two dimensions, okay? And this is how he saw this. This is his two-dimensional way of thinking, two-dimensional way of thinking. I have the standard deviation on this axis, which measures the risk. And I have the average return on this asset, which measures profitability. <laughs> hmm? When you have a portfolio, and I have some portfolios here in front of you, for example, this portfolio here corresponds to 75% bonds, 25% stocks. This has a certain risk, which is low, is the lowest, lowest risk, and it has a certain expected return, it's right here. But if you change, for example, you have now 50% bonds, 50% stocks, your investment is here. And this is the way that Markovic was thinking. Now, this is important because, again, we have a two-dimensional view of the world. What do you prefer, this or that? What do you prefer, this or that? Is that we don't know. We don't know. If you want to make more money, you go here, but also gives you more risk. Here, you have less risk, you also make less money. And here, only stocks, you have the highest risk and the highest return. Hmm? But what is clear is if I give you an investment which is here, it has this risk and this return, would you like it? You probably don't, because this one is better, gives you better return, same risk. This one is also better, because it gives you same risk, sorry, same return, less risk. 
Hmm? If we look at our snow swap, our snow swap had a return of 10%, which is here, and it had a risk of 50% originally. With only one swap, it was 50%. It was way out there, 50%. Our investment was there, it was very bad. When we have 100 swaps, that's one snow swap. When we have 100 swaps, what we saw that it was here, it was 10% return and 5% standard deviation. So 100 swaps are here. Is this clear? One swap way over there, a hundred swaps way over here. This is good. So this is good. This is not good. This is what Markovic did, 1952. And we're going to take that approach to look at investments and understand what we're doing. Okay. Um, so what you have here, this is called the a capital asset pricing model curve, CAPM curve. And you can see that if you have only bonds, when you add stocks, the risk goes down and the performance goes up. And then the risk goes up and the performance goes up. But see, this is interesting. This part here is interesting because it says that when you have a portfolio of only bonds, you have a certain risk and a certain standard deviation. But when you put some stocks into it, this is better than that. You see? And this is because of diversification. This is because the correlation between bonds and stocks is less than one. This is what creates this effect, which is that the performance numbers improve. This is an improvement. A clear improvement, okay? This point here is strictly better than this point here. Okay, so you can take this beyond stocks and bonds and you, what you can think is of the following thing. Look at all the possible investments. Look at all the possible investments, all. Look at all possible investments. We look at, we only care about the risk and the return. We only care about the standard deviation and the expected return. So every investment gives us a point on this plane. These are all the possible investments. Okay, whenever you're looking at an investment, whatever it is, good or bad, what Markowitz says is you put it on this plane. They're all here. They are all here. Now what? When all my investments are here, it turns out that you look at the resulting group of points that we have, and there's going to be an area where there are no points, no portfolios. There are no portfolios. There's nothing there. These are the area which are too good to be true. They are too good. There's nothing there. All of my investments are down here. So because of that, Markovich came up with the concept of the efficient frontier. And the efficient frontier is the boundary between the points that exist and those that do not exist. That's the, de that's the definition of the efficient frontier. If you put all of the portfolios which, are, which exist on a plane, suddenly this efficient frontier will emerge. And what Markovich said is that you want to invest always there. Always invest in the efficient frontier, always. Why? We saw that already. Let's say that I look at this investment here. This investment is suboptimal. Suboptimal. 
Okay, meaning that there is a better investment. There's actually two investments which are guaranteed to be better, two. Which ones are those? Can anybody write this on the screen? Show me two investments which are better than this one. Better than this one. You can write on the screen. Can you write an investment which is better than this one? There's two. Can you? Anybody can write on the screen? So what investment is this one? This investment is better. Why? Has the same risk and better return. There's another one which is also better. Which one is it? Anybody can write on the screen? I think you are physically able to write on the screen, right? I've permissioned everybody to write on the screen. Another one is here. Why is this better? Because it's the same return as less risk. Risk is bad, return is good. So, according to Markowitz, this is suboptimal because either this one or that one are better. So according to Markovic, you don't want to have this portfolio as an investment. You want that one or that one. The one above or the one to the left. But that one is suboptimal. Is this clear? This is very important. Everybody needs to understand this, everybody. This is the way Markovic was thinking about investments. And we're going to be using this in all our thinking because when we want to construct an optimal investment portfolio, optimal investment strategy, we're always going to think like this. Okay. So no one says anything. I assume this is understood. Okay. Um, If we go now beyond this concept, what Markovic says is that we should always invest in the efficient frontier. But he doesn't say where. He doesn't say where. The efficient frontier is there. We're going to invest in the efficient frontier, maybe there, maybe there. How do we know where we invest on the efficient frontier? How do we know where? The next question is where on the efficient frontier do we invest, okay? So again, if I go back to Markovic, Markovic says invest here on the frontier. That's what he says. But he doesn't say where. You could be here or you could be there. And from Markovic's perspective, it's optimal. Both of them are optimal. So it, and another person came through. He also won the Nobel Prize. His name was Sharp. So Sharp told us exactly where we want to invest on the frontier. He gives us a point on the frontier and says, invest here. Before I explain this, what I want to do is I want to um, do a little experiment. I want to present a problem to you. And my problem is this. This is the problem that I want to present to you. Imagine that you are hired, you're hired and you're gonna be paid a bonus if you make more money than a certain arm. So for example, you make, I give you $1 million if you make 5% return. This is your salary, this is what I give you, okay? I hire you to work, to, to do investments, and then I look at your performance. If your performance is 5% or better, I give you $1 million. 
If your performance is less than 5%, I give you nothing. Your salary is nothing. You understand? This is your salary. This is not an investment. This is how you get paid. You're going you're gonna to have a job. And this is your salary. It's an employment, employment contract. And you understand this? Okay, so if this is your salary, how, which portfolio would you build? Which portfolio would you build if you are paid this much? Let's look. We're looking for a portfolio. This is my unknown. And I want my portfolio to exceed the probability, sorry, to maximize, maximize the probability that I make 5%. I'm not looking to make seven or eight or 20%. I just want to make five because my payment is the same if I make more than five. So what I want to do is I want to maximize the probability that my, that my return, that my portfolio is more than 5%. And now I'm going to do the following calculation. Is this understood? If the portfolio is more than five, it gives me more than 5%, you make $1 million. This is your salary, this is your job. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is this, I'm gonna assume my portfolio is Gaussian. Or normally, Distributed. Everybody knows what this means. You know what the Gaussian is, what the standard deviation is. That's my Gaussian distribution. That's my Gaussian distribution. Hmm? So the probability that my portfolio exceeds a certain benchmark R, the benchmark is this one, is the following. I'm, gonna, I'm going to remove from both expressions mu, mu and sigma. I remove mu and I divide by sigma, where mu and sigma is the expectation and the volatility of the portfolio. And you know that if I take a Gaussian random variable and I remove the mean and divide by the standard deviation, the result is a normal 0, 1. Hmm? Therefore, what this tells me is the probability, this is the same as the pr probability, calculated with the cumulative distribution of the Gaussian. The cumulative distribution of the Gaussian, phi, of a certain point is the uh, integral of the Gaussian variable. You must have seen this, yes? By the way, this is uh, what you would need to calculate the probability of default of my fund, the snow fund, when there is leverage, the part two for extra marks in assignment number three. Is this clear? All right, so I hope it's clear. Because this is now independent of my portfolio, this is just my Gaussian. This can be expressed like that, where this is the cumulative distribution of the Gaussian. The cumulative distribution of the Gaussian is a function which is increasing. Is increasing. Because it's increasing, if I want to maximize this, I want to maximize what's inside, which is this. In other words, this is something very important, a very important consequence of all of this thinking, which is that Maximizing this number will maximize the probability that we get paid a bonus. 
okay? Maximizing this number is maximizing the probability that we make a bonus. So this number is very important. And this number is called the Sharpe Ratio. Remember, this is the sub ratio number that we saw as we explained the snow swap. We saw that one snow swap had a sub ratio of 50%, one half. One half. And then we saw that the sub ratio of 100 swaps a sub ratio of two. Okay. Actually, no, that was that wasn't what happened. It was um, zero point two. One snow swap had a ratio of zero point two, very very low. But a hundred swaps had a sub ratio of two. Two is very good. So again, this is all the sub-ratio, and it's linked to the probability that a portfolio exceeds a certain performance benchmark. Okay? All right. So this was Sharp. Richard Sharp. He got the Nobel Prize also. Nobel Prize. Winner. Nobel Prize winner. Any questions on this? So this is going to be something we have used it already two days ago. We're going to use it in the future all the time because it helps us understand how to do investments which are optimal. Okay. Now, I hope this is understood because I'm going to make this example a little bit more complicated. And now what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to have a different employment contract. I'm going to hire a portfolio manager that will be paid a bonus if the, if the return is are in excess of a certain index. Now, the thing here is that the index is random. We don't know what the performance of the index is going to be. Let's say this is the Hang Seng index of Hong Kong. Right? If you want to be paid a million dollars if your performance is 5% above the Hang Seng Index, we don't know what performance we want to have because we don't know what performance the Hang Seng Index is going to have. So this, per this benchmark is now relative to an index. An example of an index is the S&P 500, the Hang Seng Index, the Nikkei, the DAX in Germany, the FTSE, all of these are indices. Hmm? Now, we need to modify our thinking if this is what we're aiming for. Because if I want now the performance of my portfolio to be more than, say, 5% or more than a benchmark in excess of an index, this index is stochastic. We don't know what the performance is. Because of that, we pass it to the other side. And what we see is that this looks very much like what we had earlier. So if, if now my portfolio and the index have a certain mean and a certain standard deviation, if I subtract the mean of that difference portfolio and the standard deviation of that difference portfolio, now what I have here is, this is Gaussian. And because it's Gaussian, I can apply the same argument as before, and I get this to be the probability of exceeding that performance. And if I want to maximize that, I maximize this. Now, and this looks like the sharp ratio, but it's different. It's different. On the one hand, I have here the difference of expected returns between the portfolio and the index. I have my benchmark. And what I have down here is something very interesting. It's the standard deviation of the difference 
of the tracking is this is called the tracking error between my portfolio and the index. So this is interesting because it says that I need to have a portfolio which is <clears throat> for this thing to be high. This will be high when this is low. So if I want a portfolio which makes this ratio high, it has to track the index very closely. This number has to be low. <clears throat> You understand that? This number has to be low so that the ratio is high. So I have to track the index very closely. I'll give you an example. Let's say that you are hired and you have to track the Hang Seng Index in Hong Kong. If your performance is very good and the performance on the index is very bad, that's bad for you. You're supposed to have a performance which tracks that index. So if the index does bad, you can do bad, but better. And if the index does well, you have to do well, but better. If this number is high, if this tracking error is high, you are penalized. That ratio will penalize you. And this is the reason why many mutual fund companies, mutual funds, track an index. Many mutual fund companies, they need to track the index. If the index goes down, they are supposed to go down too, because they have to go up when the index is up. Hmm? And this creates a, a very interesting way of investing, which is as follows. So I'll, give you, I'll give you an example. I hope you understand this. Okay. I hope that it has to do with the concept of portable alpha, and it's as follows. Portable Alpha. Portable Alpha. Okay. Um, I'm going to use an example. How can I, if I go to my previous example, how can I achieve this? How can I achieve this number to be high? Let me ask a simpler question, and I, I hope someone can say something, even, even on the chat, okay? How can I make this low? How can I make this low? Let's start there. How can I make this low? How can I make the tracking error low? Let's say that my benchmark is the Hang Seng Index. I'm going to for example, buy Hang Seng Index Futures. Do you know what Index Futures are? Yes or no? No, you don't know. Okay, so I will explain that later then. Let me continue and then I will explain uh, what uh, Futures are. Okay, in fact, maybe I can, maybe I can show you let me see if I can find it, okay, online, and maybe I can show it to you now. Give me a... I'm going to stop this share, and I'll show you something. I, I, I hope you know what I'm talking about, but I need to make sure. And for that, I'm going to... Okay, I hope you know this. Hope you know this. I'm going to go here and I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to share this. What is this? This is the Hang Seng Index. Okay. The Hang Seng Index. Um, the Hang Seng Index already closed. It closes at 4 p.m. Hong Kong time. It's closed, okay? Um, and when this index is closed, like now, <clears throat> you can trade futures on it, okay? In fact, you can trade futures on it for delivery a few months from now. In a, in, you can have a contract. We're going to see futures a little bit later. 
okay, but I'll explain now, which is you can buy futures on the index. And the futures that you buy on the index are essentially free, very cheap. Mm -hmm. And this has the property that when the index goes up, you make money, and when it goes down, you lose money. And you can do this without spending money. You can enter into a futures contract very inexpensively. You only have to put margin, which is about 10% or 5%, depends on who you are. Okay, <clears throat> so you can have a $1 million futures position with only 100,000. Okay, or if you don't have that money, uh, I mean futures you cannot do in a small amounts, but you can do a $1 future with about 10 cents of deposit. Okay, so it's an inexpensive way of doing uh, the futures on the Hang Seng index. So this is a typical benchmark. This is a very oftentimes used benchmark. What we called Y in my previous <coughs> slide, okay? <coughs> so this is one such example. Uh, if I go back now to my <coughs> previous to my presentation, That will be an example. That will be an example of a, of a, of a benchmark. <clears throat> and what this means, this way of thinking means that <clears throat> I can construct a type of um, investment which is portable alpha. Imagine I do this. Imagine I have a portfolio which is Hang Seng Futures plus that other portfolio that gave me 5%. Then this is the way to optimize my portfolio because the tracking error is now the same at the standard deviation of this portfolio that gives me 5% and that's low. And because I have this 5% return here, my excess return to the Hang Seng is 5%. So this is a good way of constructing an investment, which is I divide it up into two parts. One part is the index and one other part is what's called alpha. We're going to see why it's called alpha in a few minutes. Hmm? And this way of constructing investments is called portable alpha. I divide my investment into a futures contract on the index and then something that just gives me a return independent of the market. We're going to see how this is done. We're going to see an example. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> and this tells me a way to classify all of the investments that exist. Um, there are investments that create alpha, and 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 the investment that create was called beta. I'll explain what. What would, so beta are investments that have an index as a reference. So stocks have an index. Hang Seng, S&P, Dow, DAX. All of these are indices. Bonds have beta, which is interest rates. When the interest rates go down, bond prices go up. Hmm? Infrastructure funds, private equity funds, credit funds, all of these have Beta. Beta is the term that we use to denote a market direction. So all of these have a market direction. Here are interest rates. Here are indices. Okay. Here we have credit rates. All of these are elements that have a market direction. And alpha are elements that don't have don't have a market direction. And this is where the interesting investment strategies occur. They don't have a market direction. And as I said earlier, most of the investments that you have is something that has a market direction 
here and something without a market direction here, alpha and beta. Hmm? All right. Um, we already saw an example of an investment without market direction, and that is our snow fund. Our snow fund has no market direction. Why? Anybody can explain why? The snow fund is here, has no market direction. Imagine that the Hang Seng Index goes up. Do we make money? Maybe. Imagine the Hang Seng Index goes down. Do we make money? Maybe. Our performance, our profitability doesn't have to do with the way markets work. The Hang Seng Index could go up or down and we can make money or not. It's independent. This is the characteristic of alpha investments. They have no market direction. If I invest in stocks, the stocks will have a beta component and they will have market direction. Okay? And a way to measure beta is through correlations. Okay, well, this is related. Why are they called alpha and beta? They're called alpha and beta because of linear regression. So let's talk about that. Okay, that will be the next thing that I'm going to do today. Before I do that, I have a comment, which is the efficient frontier. Remember what Markovich did? The efficient frontier of Markovich, when you introduce an investment with alpha, it moves up. It's very interesting. We will see this. Okay, let me just move on to another thing. Um, I'm going to pass over this. I'm going to talk about regression analysis. Okay, and the regression analysis is to get is something that we do to get a quantitative expression of relationships. So some investments are directly dependent on market variables. Others are not. We're going to see both. The interesting ones are here. Investments are truly hedged and not, not directly dependent on external events. Like for example, our snow fund and others that we will build. Okay. And a way to detect this is through regression analysis. Regression analysis is a mathematical concept that tells us that. Write in the chat yes or no if you know what regression analysis is. Maybe I can do this. Let me see if I can do this on, on Zoom. Um, can you write on the chat yes, you know what regression analysis is? No, you do not know what regression analysis is. Can you write that on the chat? No. No. Three people say no. Please write everybody. You do not know what it is. Okay. Okay. No. Okay. Good. Thank you. Enough. I, so you don't know what it is. So you're going to, I'm going to teach you what it is. In fact, I'm going to ask you to do something. Um, hmm. Okay, let me, let me, I, I need you to understand this. This is very important. I need you to understand this. And for that, I'm going to do, do I have a volunteer? Someone wants to talk to me about stocks? Do I have a volunteer? I'm sharing my Hang Seng Index. Okay, if I look at my Hang Seng Index over, say, the last uh, six months, this is what it looks like. Okay, if I do this over the last five years, this is what it looks like. Okay, it comes up and it comes down. 
I can go to one of the tools that exists on the internet, for example, Google Finance, and I can see what the markets are doing today. And I'm gonna do here Hang Seng. Hang Seng Index is there. The same thing that we saw earlier, just on a different, different format. You can look at the last five years, and this has been the Hang Seng Index for five years. Okay, all right, <clears throat> um, can someone give me the name of a stock in Hong Kong, if possible? Can you give me the name of a stock, anybody? That's Tencent, okay? And then I can look at something similar. <coughs> That's uh, the Tencent Holdings performance over the last five years. Let's say that I'm going to compare this compared to the Hong, the Hong Kong exchange. That's the Hang Seng Index, look at that. That's the comparison be between Tencent and the Hang Seng Index. That's Tencent and that's the Hang Seng Index. When you look at this picture, what strikes you? What do you see there which is interesting? What do you find interesting? Tell me. What do you find interesting here? Can someone say something? I would like for someone to say something. So I have something in the chat, I'm gonna check. Okay. Zero, zero, I don't know what that chat means, okay. All right, what do you find interesting here? Say something. Their trends are similar. Correct. The trends are similar. See, when the Hang Seng goes up, sorry, when Tencent goes up, the Hang Seng goes up. When the Hang Seng goes down, it goes down. Then here they're more or less flat. Then this goes up, this goes up. This goes down, this goes down. The trend is similar. How can we quantify how similar the trends are? This is what linear regression is going to do, okay? So the trends, so um, Dai said trends are similar. We're going to express how trends are similar. And I, we do that as follows as follows. <clears throat> By the way, I'm going to give you an assignment. You're going to have to calculate something. Okay, let me tell you what it is. Um, you're, going to you're going to have, this is assignment number four. I'll just explain because I have this in front of me and you can do this on your own. You're going to have to download the daily prices of Hang Seng and one stock. Could be Tencent, it could be Alibaba, it could be something, I don't care, okay? But a, a stock in Hong Kong, in the Hong Kong index, okay? You have to download those pieces of data, that data set. Daily prices for several years. Okay, five, for example. Because once you have that, this is what we're going to do, okay? You, you, please remember this picture in front of you. I'm going to do a new share, okay? We're going to analyze the similarity of these trends as follows. As follows. 
this is the trends and they look similar, right? Well, we're going to calculate the following thing. We're going to take our stock. This is my stock. And we can do this with many indices. We're going to start with one, just one, okay? This we're going to, for now, remove. We'll come to this later. Hang Seng Index. And if this is my stock price, and that's my Hang Seng Index price, there could be a linear relationship between those. But we don't want prices here. It's very important that we do not do this with prices. There are statistical reasons why the price will not work. What we have to do here is we have to use the return. Return. I remind you, the return was the price uh, today minus the price yesterday divided by the price yesterday. That's the return. And we'll have to use this formula for the index and for the stock. Not the price, the return. And this gives you a time series. For five years, that's going to be more about 1,000 points. 1,000 values. And when you have these 1,000 values, you can express this linear relationship. You can say that the stock is equal to a number plus another number that multiplies the index performance. And this number is called alpha and this number is called beta. And this has to do with the alpha and beta that we used when we explained the investment. Some investments have very low beta and high alpha, they're called alpha. And some have very low alpha and very high beta, and they're called beta for that reason. You will see that Tencent or almost any stock you take in Hong Kong will have very high beta and low alpha to the Hang Seng Index. So they are beta investments because the beta is high and the alpha is low. Okay, so you have to find alpha and beta. Now, how do you find alpha and beta? You have not seen linear regression, so this may be new to you. I don't know, maybe you saw it and you called it a different way. This is not algebra, this is not mathematics, this is not a system of equations. Why? Because these are random variables. So when we say that my my fund, my stock, is um, what we're going to take n equals one in our example here. Okay, so all of these they're not there. When I say this, this is done statistically, not mathematically, meaning there's an error, and the error has to be Gaussian with mean zero. Gaussian with mean zero. Okay. So how can you find alpha and beta? It's not an equation. I mean, this is not, uh, this is a time series, this is 1,000 points. This is 1,000 points, 1,000 values. How do you find alpha and beta when I have 1,000 values? If I have one value, I know how to solve it, but I have 1,000. How do I do, how do I solve this when I have 1,000 values? I find it statistically. It's right. For the case of only one, this is the formula, okay? Beta one is equal to the covariance, it's right here, between my stock and the index divided by the volatility squared, the standard deviation of my stock. It's right here. If you use Microsoft Excel, Excel will do this for you. Okay, you don't have to calculate this. You don't have to calculate the variances and the covariances and this and that. So what I want you to do, assignment number four is gonna be, you have to pick a stock and you have to pick the Hang Seng Index and you have to calculate alpha and beta. This is how you do beta. This is not how you do alpha, alpha is different. But Excel will do it for you. So I need you to do that, 
Okay, that's this, that's what you're going to do. And this is very good because this is going to be our way of starting to analyze the relationship between investments. And this is very important. You saw that the trends are similar and the similarity is expressed here. This is the similarity. This is the similarity. There's another way of looking at these things, which I have here. <clears throat> If you look at the numbers of, again, we're only looking at returns, 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 okay? Only returns. When I look at returns on a daily basis, and I put them, for example, here on a plane, and this is the actual returns. You see, sometimes they are high, sometimes they're low. And I put the returns of my stock and the index. You will see that when one is high, the other one is high. When one is low, the other one is low. So when you put them here, the regression line is the one that best fits all of those points. That's another way to understand this relationship. Hmm? If you look at this with a magnifying glass, you will see what we have here, which is that the line doesn't go through all the points. It can't. There's no way. Okay, But it does give us a fitted value, meaning the actual point that you have in that two-dimensional plane has a point which is closest to it on the on, on that line, and that's the that's the fitted value. What we want is we want the, um, the these numbers have a characteristic which is that the error squared is minimized. Okay, so let me ask you again: Have you seen? linear regression under a different name. I'm surprised you have never seen it. Have you seen linear regression maybe under a different name? Yes or no on the chat? You already said no, but maybe you used a different name. Now that you know what it is, have you seen it before maybe under a different name? Have you seen it before? Yes or no in the chat? Yes, you have. Okay. So someone, yes, you have. Okay, good. Okay. You, you have, okay, good. You have seen it under a different name. That's what I, that's what I thought. So this is called, in English, this is called linear regression. Okay. And in your assignment, you're going to have to download index stock and a stock and do a linear regression between the two of them. Only one index, so this n equals one in this expression. That's all I want you to do. Okay. Okay, that's good. Okay, so you know this. This is better. I was a little scared, knowing that you have not seen this. Okay. Any questions? So this is clear. You know this. You can do this in multi dimensions. I mean, the formula that I saw here is in in in, in many dimensions. You can do this in multi dimensions. In multi dimensions, you have betas, which could be positive, negative. This is difficult to do. Okay, but uh, you probably have seen it also in multi-dimensions. Uh, the method that you would use will work just the same when you're doing this in multi-dimensions. Mm -hmm. And just that in multi-dimensions you have not one beta, you have many different betas. One alpha, though. So alpha only one, but many different betas. Okay? Okay. All right. I, so what comes after this is non-normal returns. And I don't know if I want to start that now or I want to make sure that you understand this. So let me, I, I want to make sure that all of this is understood. I feel relieved that you have seen linear regression uh, before. Hmm? So I'm going to assume that you are able to download the data and perform linear regression. Have you done, let me ask you another question. Please answer in the chat. Have you done linear regressions? before by downloading data yourselves. Have you done it? Yes or no? No, no one wants to say something? Yes, you have, never download, okay. Okay, never download. 
so you can download in many different ways um, I don't know which one is most popular in China but there's many ways of downloading daily data uh, Google will give it to you Yahoo will give it to you I'm sure that there are you know Baidu may give it to you I don't know okay so see if you can find it if you have difficulties you let me know okay all right the thing about linear regression, and this is the important thing, we're, you're going to do this and it's all very good mm -hmm. and very useful. However, however, um, linear regression is based on one assumption, which is that all of these returns are normal. Okay, Normal means that they have a distribution, which is the Gaussian, this one. Okay. The returns have to be normal. If they are not normal, then linear regression doesn't exactly work and other things don't exactly work. Because of that, we have to look at what happens when returns stopped being normal. So what you have here is a picture of what returns look like <coughs> when they are normal. It's here. Okay? They look like that. However, look at this. When you do the return histogram, sometimes, and usually to the left, which corresponds to the loss part of the distribution, <coughs> you see events which are impossible according to a Gaussian fit. They are, these are too frequent. The Gaussian will tell me that there should be nothing there, but then we see a lot of events. We see a lot of events. This is a reflection that we're dealing with returns which are not normal. And in fact, they have what's called tail behavior. Left tail. You know what a tail is? When you have an animal, the tail. Okay? So this is the tail of the distribution. And when you have a distribution that has a tail, then many of the methods that are developed for Gaussian markets stop working. So what I'm going to do here is tell you how these things are done. Um, some of the things are very advanced, but some we will need. Okay. So for example, one of the things that we're going to be doing is we're going to use moving windows. We already saw that. Uh, and in a moving window, you have a certain window and the window moves. And here you have a certain mean and a certain return, and that mean and return would change. <clears throat> That's one approach. We're not going to be very interested in that approach. This one is another one is called exponentially weighted moving averages. Also not very interested. Okay. Uh, these ones are very advanced mathematics although maybe this one you have seen the ARMA models auto regressive maybe you have seen auto regressive models maybe we are not going to adopt this perspective we're going to adopt a different perspective and a perspective which is more focused on investments okay the first comment that I'm going to make is there is a concept called the semi-standard deviation. And what the semi-standard deviation is is as follows. It's a bit complicated to explain, but I'm not going to be interested in it. I'll just tell you in case you run into it. What you do is this. Every month you look at or every day you look at your returns. These are the actual returns of your investment. And then you set a benchmark, usually zero. And when you have a number which is a loss, this thing here means that you only look at this number when it's positive. In other words, you look at this number only when this number is negative, when you're making, when you're making losses. Hmm? So this is, it looks like the standard deviation, like the standard deviation, but only in the bad months, only in the bad months. In other words, when you're above the benchmark, when it's good, when it's good months, it is not part of the calculation. Okay? 
So it is a fragmented expression for the standard deviation where you only consider the bad days or the bad months. And then you divide like this, like the standard deviation, you take the square root. Okay, this has a name, it's called the semi, semi standard deviation. Semi because here you take only some of the points, not all of the points, only the bad ones. Okay, so only if the return is bad, only. So some people use this <coughs> when you're dealing with non-Gaussian markets. The reason is why. The reason is when you look at a, for example, a graph like that, these things are part of the semi standard deviation and this part is not. See? But we're not interested in that. In this course, I'm not going to be interested in this because there is very limited use of what you can do with this and what you can do with this is not very useful, not very interesting. Okay? Um, another thing that people do with the semi-standard deviation is you go to the sharp ratio, which was mu minus r divided by sigma. Oops. Mu minus r divided by sigma. Okay? And they replace the sigma by the semi-standard deviation. We're also not going to do that. We are not going to do it. Okay? There's also some misunderstanding as to what this means. We are not going to use this in this course. What we are going to use is other things. We're going to use moments. What is a moment? What is a moment? A moment is this. The mean is the first moment of a, of a distribution. The standard deviation is the second moment. You can have the third, the fourth, so we're going to look at the third and the fourth moments of the distribution, which have a name. They're called skewness, that's the third, and kurtosis, which is the fourth moment. Okay. Why are we using this? We are using um, the skewness and the kurtosis because there is information here which captures something of what happens in the tails. You see. The fact that we are taking the uh, power three, when we look at the difference between the, my daily return and my average return means that when this number is big, the cubic is even bigger. So this has a way of amplifying, the skewness amplifies, amplifies the effects of big events and if the big event is negative it gives me a negative number and if it's positive it gives me a positive number so this amplification gives me an idea if the distribution is skewed to the losses or skewed to the gains you see that's what it does and if you look at this exp expression, it looks very complicated. This part is clear. This is what you see when you have a moment, right? This part is clear. But this part looks very surprising. What is this? This is very surprising. But let me tell you, this is like 1 over n. Not exactly, but it's like 1 over n. When n is big, this is like 1 over n. Why did I write this and not 1 over n? The reason I wrote this and not 1 over n is because statisticians tell me that because the number of degrees of freedom here is one less, because this thing depends on the same sample, this is the right estimator. So that's okay, we just believe that. You just believe that. But you think that what you have here is like 1 over n. It is not exactly 1 over n, but it's like 1 over n. So it should not scare you. Hmm? It should not scare you. This is very easy. And then finally, there's another thing here, which is I'm taking the third moment and I divide by the cubic power of the standard deviation. And but I do this for I do this for normalization reasons. This is just to normalize. Okay? So this is just to normalize, because otherwise I may get a number which is very, very small. If these are daily returns, the number is very, very small. So I divide by this and I get a normalized 
central moment. So this is a normalized third central moment. I assume you have seen this in a statistic. Central means that you're removing the mean. Moment means that you're taking a power. Third means that you're taking the third power. And normalized means that you divide by the standard deviation cubed. This number gives significance to my distribution and it will tell me if my distribution is skewed to the right or skewed to the left. If I try to calculate this, for example, on this graph that I showed you here, here, here my skewness because of this event will probably be negative which means that my distribution exhibits large losses. The fact that my skew is negative usually means that my distribution exhibits large losses. Okay? It's a statistical way of getting that. Now, um, that's the third moment. The third moment is easy to explain. The fourth moment is a bit more complicated to explain. The fourth moment is here. It follows the same pattern. And it, it, this is again like 1 over n. Think of this like 1 over n. It's also normalized. But here I do something else, which is I subtract this. This is like the number 3. Why I subtract this? I subtract this because when I apply this expression to the Gaussian distribution, I get the number three. So this is something that I use to compare my distribution to the Gaussian distribution. And if the kurtosis is um, high, this is the important one. If the, if the kurtosis is a high number, bigger than zero, high number, that means that my distribution has what's called fat tails, which is bad news. It means that the distribution could have very big losses or very, very big gains, but it's going to have events which are on the tails. Okay? This is bad. If my distribution has negative kurtosis, that means that it's very concentrated. That means it's a very concentrated. It's a very concentrated. Everything is very narrow. And if it's uh, zero, it's like the Gaussian. Not a Gaussian, but like the Gaussian. OK? Now, uh, so this is important, but a little bit less. Still, these are important numbers to consider. Hmm? These are important numbers to consider. But sometimes they give us important things, and sometimes they don't. Okay, sometimes they give us important things, sometimes they don't. And this is where I mentioned that this, from a statistical perspective, this is like 1 over n, that's like 1 over n, and this is like 3. Okay, but these are the actual exact numbers. But you don't need to know that. I am not going to ask you to do calculations with the, um, the skewness or the kurtosis, and in particular, I just want to highlight one thing, which is that the skewness and the kurtosis, some people use them, but you have to be very careful because the power 3 is a very big power. When you look at the kurtosis over time, you would see that sometimes it has these jumps. Why? These are outlier events. Outlier is a large extreme event. Okay, so when you have large extreme events, outliers, <clears throat> they affect your skewness calculation in such a way that whatever number you had before, when your event happens, it changes the skewness in a very big way. So we're going to have to be very careful, very careful when we use the skewness and the kurtosis. Um, <clears throat> because big events will make big changes. And sometimes the big changes is not what we want. When you look at the kurtosis, it's even worse because the fourth power is even bigger than the third power, okay? So this is part of the reason that we don't want to use the skinness and the kurtosis very often. And I actually have an, an example of an investment here, which is 
um, is where I used to show that you have to be very careful with these things. If I have, for example, this, 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 look at this investment. It's terrible, right? No one likes it, right? Still, it has very good skewness. The skewness is very good. It's 30% per year, positive, positive, positive. Okay? Still, it loses money. The average return is positive too. Still, it loses money. We saw that last week. You can have positive average return and still lose money. You can have that and also positive skewness. So you have to be very careful. That's why I don't like to use skewness very much. I like to use linear regression, which you're going to do, but skewness and kurtosis I don't like to use very much. They can be very misleading sometimes, okay? I just still, I want you to know them because there's gonna be things that we can do with that, okay? So this is the end of my mathematical discussion. <clears throat> we have three minutes. If you have any questions, what I need you to do now is I need you to learn how you can, uh, I need you to learn how to download data and how to do linear regression on that data. I will write assignment number four today and I will share with you, but I advise you this is what you have to do. Okay, when you wake up tomorrow, you should have it, and then you know what you need to do. But you need to download data and you need to do analysis with that data. We're gonna start with uh, linear regression. <clears throat>